This weekend, we address the topic of Austrian investing with Chris Casey, the Managing Director of Windrock Wealth Management. Chris is an investment advisor for, for high net worth clients, but unlike most investment advisors, he understands and applies Austrian business cycle theory and Austrian economics for his clients. Chris has a degree in economics from the University of Illinois, and he's a chartered financial analyst. He's also a frequent writer and speaker on the topic of Austrian economics, appearing at conferences like Gold Money and Freedom Fest, and appearing on websites like Mises.org and Zero Hedge. If you're an investor and you're interested in Austrian economics, I'm sure you're going to enjoy our show. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Deist. Very happy to be talking this weekend with Chris Casey from Windrock Wealth. Chris, how are you today? Great. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Well, Chris, talk to us a little bit about this emerging phenomenon of Austrian investing. In other words, you know, Jimmy Rogers came out with his famous book, Hot Commodities, which is now about 10 years old, maybe a little more than that. And he's always been viewed as at least faintly Austrian. Uh, Peter Schiff came to have some renown around the 2008 crash. We, and, and obviously talking in an Austrian manner about money, we now have Mark Spitznagel, who wrote the, the infamous book, The Tao of Capital, which is very much from an Austrian perspective. And we even have individual investment firms, uh, wealth advisory firms like your own, um, now applying or talking openly about Austrian economics. So I would like to hear your perspective on whether there is such a thing as Austrian investing, so to speak. Well, I certainly do. And, you know, first I can comment that I do think it's been growing or, or the recognition of the Austrian school has certainly been growing within the financial community. I'll give you a couple examples. One is that, and I'm sure every author has this experience, but if, if I write an article for the daily uh, blog at Mises, I guarantee I'll get three letters. And mm -hmm. each of them I would describe as one is crazy, one is happy, and one is sad. And the crazy one, which I think everyone has experienced, and, you know, it's the, the group the uh, graduate Keynesian uh, student who's who's just bitter and, and is right trying to criticize the article. The happy one is just compliments. Hey, I love love this article. Thanks for writing it. You know, I've been thinking about this and, and this, you know, encapsulates my thoughts perfectly. And the sad one is from finance professionals, whether it's wealth managers or others that are within these large corporations, these warehouses, whether it's Morgan Stanley, UBS, what have you that believe everything that they just read and they believe in Austrian economics, but they can't comment on it and they can't tell their clients about it because it doesn't comport with with the story that the firm is uh, is putting out there. So those I, I would describe as, as a sad kind of response. And I get a lot of those um, over the last couple of years. Another, I think, phenomena that you can point to is, is if you go to social media. So for instance, LinkedIn even. Uh, here you have several groups. I know that that Mises has ones, I think, Friends of the Mises Institute, which has, and I'm guessing it's, you know, just shy of 10,000 members. You also yes. have, you know, Austrian School of uh, Economics for Finance Professionals. And you, here you have thousands of people that are members. And it's shocking if you go through the membership role, how many are within the financial community. So I do think it's been growing over the years substantially. Uh, and this is despite the fact that a lot of people also want to keep it quiet. So a couple of years ago, I was actually at a, a Mises event and I, I met this hedge fund manager and he was just in the Wall Street Journal for having made a lot of money. I won't even I won't even comment on what the particular investment was because it would, it would give it away probably who this individual was. And I asked him, I said, well, you were quoted extensively in the Wall Street Journal and you never mentioned Austrian economics. Why is that? And he said, well, I'm not going to mention that. That's a competitive advantage I have. And so based on the last you know, 12 years, 14 years of what's been occurring in the markets based on you know, what the authorities have been saying and they've been proven wrong time and time again, I think it really has been taking off as far as the financial community. Well, I certainly get the sense that a lot of people on Wall Street and in the financial industry secretly agree with us, but they make their living off the Keynesian monetary bubble. So it's not at least in a short term interest to profess Austrianism. Oh, I totally, I, I completely agree with that. Um, so you're right. There's, I guess there's two camps out there. There are those that just don't know better and, and have never thought about Austrian economics or understand how they're benefiting from what the Federal Reserve has been doing since August of 08. And then there's the other camp, which which knows better. And you're right, are 
profiting from it, and they'll ride this train as long as they can. Well, Chris, we talked to Bob Murphy on this show a couple of weeks ago, and he made a comment to the effect that understanding Austrian economics and especially understanding Austrian business cycle theory is necessary to be a knowledgeable investor, but it's not sufficient to be a knowledgeable investor. And I'd like your comment on that. To me, that makes a lot of sense. And and I, I think he's right in that it is necessary. Uh, James Grant, I remember, had a, had a line he used where you're still, with investing, you're still fumbling in the dark, but at least with a... Um, with Austrian economic background, you have a flashlight with you. So you can hopefully avoid the, the, you know, the big heavy things that you could trip over. And it's true. I think it is critical. And the reason it's critical is because it helps you avoid bubbles. I guess there's really two things. One's that it helps you avoid bubbles because you're, you can at least understand what's causing recessions. And when you have a recession, that's the, the most immediate and easiest way to, to uh, prick a bubble that's out there. And secondly, it's, it, the Austrian school has a unique explanation of inflation price inflation. So, to under, and I realize that no one's concerned about that today because we haven't really experienced or, or officially experienced significant inflation really since the 1970s. But I think it is something that investors should be concerned about going forward. And with the Austrian school's explanation, I think you can see it coming, you can understand the causes, and you can also um, protect yourself accordingly. So, I think Bob's right. It's necessary uh, as a background, but certainly not enough. You still have to have a rigorous understanding as to financial markets and instruments to be able to adequately invest uh, appropriately. Well, Chris, you recently did a great interview with the Dollar Vigilante, Jeff Berwick's outfit. And I'd like to, to use a quote from that interview when you're talking about the cluelessness of investment advisors. And you told uh, Dollar Vigilante, I cannot tell you how many times I've asked a chief investment officer of a major wealth advisory firm what causes recessions. And the response is either we don't know or we're agnostic as to the economy whatever that means. So I, I came away from that going, if I asked my uh, financial advisors what he, he or she thinks about the economy and he said, I'm agnostic, I think I would find a new advisor. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that. I always tell people that should be the first question you ask a financial advisor is what causes recessions, what causes inflation. And that, that statement I made in that interview, that, that's an accurate statement. I have attended a number of luncheons where you have not even chief investment officers, but I'm talking chief economists from major banks, especially in the Chicagoland area. And if you ask, you know, what causes these, they really don't, they don't know. And what's even scarier, they haven't really given it any thought. And perhaps what's even scarier than that, they don't believe they need to. And to me, I think that's, that's a, just a gross failing. It's the first question, because it's the first question they should be asking, what causes these? So that, that's an actually, that's a completely true statement. And I, I, I couldn't agree more that that's a question that everyone should ask their financial advisor. Well, it seems that an understanding of the Fed and an understanding of money and monetary policy is totally lacking amongst investment advisors and fund managers. It's almost astonishing when you think about it. I agree. And it's in, in, in that's the spite over the last you know, 12, 14 years of having the markets experience um, circumstances that we've never seen before. And it's especially pronounced when you consider how the markets have performed relative to how many officials have described the markets or how they thought they would perform. So what I mean by that is you have Ben Bernanke famously saying in 02 to Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, listen, we thank due to you two, we understand what causes recessions and we won't have one again. We're never going to have a Great Depression again because now we understand what causes them. And he said in 08, in January of 08, you know, the Federal Reserve is not forecasting a recession. So you add that with his comments about housing, literally maybe six to nine months right before housing peaked, that he just doesn't accept the premise that there could be a nationwide housing decline. You look at even like Timothy Geithner, when he famously said, I think it was in April of 11, there's no chance the U.S. can ever be downgraded as far as their AAA debt rating. And then in August of that same year, it was. So, you know, not only have the markets experienced something that we've never seen before, but it's especially pronounced when you uh, contrast it to how government officials are discussing the economy. But Chris, what's so fascinating here is that they are wedded to econometrics and modeling. I mean, this really is their religion. I mean, you, as you point out, the, the mainstream, they totally missed the tech stock bust. They totally missed the broader equities crash of 2008, the housing bust. But from an Austrian perspective, these were totally foreseeable events. They were, and, and many, many re Austrians are on record as, as having foreseen these. You're right. You would think that if, if I had a philosophy, economic philosophy, and I experienced these huge uh, errors in my analysis, you would think you'd go back to the drawing board and think, okay, something's wrong here. Let's, let's examine what we should do differently. 
maybe there's a different explanation. But you're right. They're they they're wedded to it. And part of it is that they're they're not even familiar with Austrian economics, some of these major policymakers. Um, it's it's fairly shocking. Well, you may have heard the old adage, and I ran this by Bob Murphy as well, <clears throat> quote unquote, never invest according to your ideology. And as you know, Austrians tend to have a reputation as perma bears. So I I wonder, do Austrian mining investors become so focused on the busts that they that they miss out on the booms? Well, I think that's a legitimate concern. It's it's also um, you, you, you well, it's it's definitely a legitimate concern when when you're looking at the markets and you understand how overvalued they are, whether you're talking about the equity or, or the bond markets, it's very easy to just say, let's pull the plug. It's going to crash at any day. But the truth is, while Austrian economics through its business cycle theory can guide us as to knowing what will eventually happen and what must happen, uh, it is true we can't time it uh, exactly. So uh, Doug Casey is always famous for saying, a financial advisor, a, an economist, Doug Casey, while something may be uh, inevitable, it's certainly not imminent. And so I do think a lot of Austrians miss out on that and go to you know 50% gold, uh, 50% cash or what have you. And really what they should recognize is that since you can't time everything, it makes sense to still be in the equity and bond markets. But you have to be nimble. You have to be careful. But you you can't just disengage completely because no one can time anything com- uh, accurately. Now, Chris, let's say a client or a potential client walks into your office. It seems like people talk about investment returns you know, net of fees. They talk about investment returns net of taxes. But you rarely hear people talk about investment returns net of inflation. Do you find this amongst your clients that people think only in nominal terms? I think most people are conditioned to do so, you know, based on the the price index levels that we've had over the last you know 20, 30 years. So they're they're just not uh, in, inclined to think in terms of of real uh, return. I mean, our clients are because they they already understand or at least have a degree of knowledge about Austrian economics and are concerned about inflation. But in general, I think the common investor certainly thinks of those terms. Uh, it's it, it's unfortunate for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one is that even with a low level of inflation, price inflation, that quickly erodes. Not your just returns, um, but your your corpus, right? It's it's eating into your investment uh, value as a whole. And so, even at a low level, you're seeing some staggering negative impact. Uh, and you know what's amazing is that people are so conditioned right now not to think about price inflation. And part of the reason is you have to go back so far into the 1970s and think about how someone, I mean, I'm 43. And, you know, for me, the, the 70s, I was a kid. So I, I have vague recollections. But you have to be much older than that to, have, to really be affected by inflation in your lifetime, especially from an investment perspective. So people, I think you're right, have just been conditioned not to think that way. But it's absolutely something they should think about because inflation can be far more damaging than taxes. And it can be far more damaging uh, just low returns in general. So I do think they should look at it in real terms. Chris, can you give us your thoughts on housing, if you would? Have any of the fundamentals changed since the housing crash of 08, at least in the U.S. market? Well, I so just to recap what, what happened in housing, obviously, we had this tremendous crash where in some markets, you know, housing prices went down maybe, you know, 80 percent, but certainly 50 percent was not unusual. Uh, housing's come back in quite a bit, although it's still probably maybe 20 percent off its its highs uh back in, in the 06, 07 area. And I, I do think housing could go up for a sustained period of time, but I do think it is a potential, has potential to go straight back down just like it did previously. And the reason being is that housing is really a function of two things, the housing prices, right? It's, it's interest rates level, interest rate levels, and it's also uh, really household income. So what you can pay and then how much does that that payment get you. And if you look at both of those factors, well, they're directly impacted by inflation and the Austrian theory of the business cycle. So the next time we have a re- recession, interest rates go up. Uh, I think housing will be dramatically negatively affected. And remember, household income still hasn't recovered from pre-08 levels. And in recession, it's just going to get worse. So you're going to have these kind of double pincers that are going to be squeezing the housing markets. And it could relate, it, it could translate into a a, a, a decline that's even more significant than we've previously experienced. So I think it's prudent for anyone that owns a home to maybe go out and get the biggest fixed rate mortgage they can and then invest it in very safe assets that'll do better than your house. Uh, alternatively, if you don't own a home, don't buy one, just rent. I think that's a very, very uh, smart move in today's market. And you see it right now, buying patterns have changed. Because of that experience, people are avoiding 
the buying a, a house, first time house uh, doesn't have that, that same cachet that it did for many years. It wasn't that that milestone in someone's life. So people are looking at renting as a very viable option, and I, I do think it makes sense. Well, it's interesting to note that in some very prosperous countries like Switzerland, some 80% of people rent and the 20% who are landlords are in effect professionals and understand what they're doing. Chris, I will leave you with one last question um, from your interview here. It sounds like uh, like Jimmy Rogers that you are somewhat bullish, at least long term on farmland. I'd love to know your thoughts on uh, on farmland and, and America's ability to serve as a breadbasket for the world. Sure. Well, the farmland thesis really has two points. The first one, as you mentioned, uh, Jim Rogers talks about extensively. So that is simply the worldwide supply and demand dynamics for foodstuffs. And you have the increasing populations, you have increasing populations in the developed world. Those populations are always demanding greater caloric intake. Uh, and the nature of the calories they're eating, so not just more calories, but what they're eating, meaning you know beef and meat, translates into even greater stress on the supply of of, uh, of various foodstuffs. So I think the long-term dynamics are fantastic for farmland. You know, farmland has gone up quite a bit in the United States since uh, over the last you know six years. But, and so like any market, it doesn't go straight up. Maybe there's going to be a cooling period. Maybe it'll continue to go up. I don't know. But I do know that the long-term dy- dynamics are great. In addition to that, though, there's a tremendous opportunity, I think, with American farmland in that if we do experience a significant inflation, I think we'll have a repeat of the 70s. And by that, I mean, if we have a price inflation in the U.S., American farm products become cheaper for foreigners, right? So corn will fetch its price in any market. And because you have a cheaper price, you have increased demand, you should have an increase in exports. And this is exactly what we saw in the 70s. There's a dramatic increase in exports with these cheaper uh, farm products. And from that, it translates into greater farmland revenue for farmers, and ultimately into greater farmland value. So if you look at the 1970s as an example, the CPIU, the, the Consumer Price Index, went up about a, over 100% in 10 years, I think about 120%. Farmland went up about 300%. So I think it's a great, not only inflation uh, hedge, but it's a great way to profit from an inflationary scenario. Well, Chris, perhaps one bit of uh, bright economic news for the U.S. Thank you so much for a great interview. We really appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.